were alone on a desert island with a tribe of hungry cannibals who think you are a god. A tribe of natives who would eat you rather than let you escape. Escape. Produced and directed by William N. Robeson and designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escape to the South Seas and a cannibal kingdom in H.G. Wells' famous story, Jimmy Goggles, the God. I doubt you'll remember anything of the ocean pioneer, though a bit of the story that came to public knowledge made headlines in the newspapers at the time. Blimey, now that I think of it, it's been over 40 years ago it happened. 40 years. And at times, yet I can still wake up in the middle of the night and see that cold, dead eye of Jimmy Goggles staring at me from the darkness. There, it gives me the creeps even now. It all started the night the ocean pioneer went to the bottom of the summer coast. Only two survivors, aside from myself, came out of that wreck. Mr. Sanders, the first mate, and a seaman named Jacob. And with a bit of luck, we had enough food and water in the longboat to see us safe to Papua. Give away, Dad. Three nights will put us on dry land again. Aye, it is lucky men we are this time. All right, just one's our time here, Jacob. This is worth for Captain Wells and ten of the lads back there. Why, another 20 fathom of blinking green water they are. Ain't all that's laying back there either, lads. You meaning something like that, Mr. Saunders? Does either of your lads know the cargo we carried? Aye. Copper, mostly, and some spices. Not that. Not. A guinea we shipped aboard a chest full of gold dust. Worth 40,000 pounds. Forty thousand. Oh. I wondered about that chest at the time, Mr. Saunders. That chest is still back there, lad. In Captain Wells' cabin. Aye. Twenty fathoms down. That'll be a nice bit of work for the salvage company. Not necessarily, eh? What is it you're meaning to say? I'm the only man alive, no ship's position when she sunk. So you are. Go on, Mr. Saunders. Suppose now, when we get to Papua... We give report ships struck a hundred miles or so to the north. Then the salvage ship goes there, we come here, and pick up a title fortune for ourselves. And how do we come here? My brother-in-law has a brig in the Sydney trade. He's come in with us. Why, Lance, are you in or are you out? Forty thousand pounds. I'm in. Aye, forty thousand pounds. A blooming fortune there for the taking. Of course we went in on it. Back in Papua, Saunders made the arrangements with his brother-in-law, Captain Ferguson. And a fortnight later, we set forth in the brig Pride of Banya. There were just the four of us in the diving suit. It was one of them kind of diving suits that don't have a pump or airline carried its own tank of compressed air attached so you could walk around on the bottom independent-like. We hung the suit on the wall in a mess room, and believe me, it was some bright times we enjoyed besides it during the three weeks the pride of Banya beat in towards on a channel. We'd wonder how long it'd be before we'd get there, and what the salvage ship might be finding a hundred miles away from the wreck. And all the time acting like we hadn't a care in the world. And... That confounded diving suit it sway back and forth like a regular human being it would. And the glass window in the front staring like a big eye in the middle of its fat copper head. We got so we'd talk to it like it was somebody. And we even give it a name. Jimmy Goggles, we called it. Jimmy Goggles. And every time we'd break open some rum, we'd pour a glass or so into Jimmy Goggles. So by the time we got to Sonna... That a smelling rubbery, his insides was as sweet as a cask of rum. 
When we found the place, we was afraid to take the brig into the rocks where the wreck was lying. So we anchored about half a mile off and all of us rode to it in the long bed. Aye, she's still there, all right. I can see the tip of one of her masts above the water. Devil take the mast. There's a fortune below I'm interested in. Oh, fear. It'll be there, lad. Eh, uh, better the port a bit. Hey, is it still agreed that uh, I'm the one to go inside Jimmy Goggles and make the first trip down? Aye, George. It's what we decided. Uh, it's easy now. Nigh on to her. I can't say I envy you none, George. Back the oars now. Easy. There, got a line around the mast. Keep us from drifting. Better get into that diving suit, George. Right away, Captain Ferguson. Aye, just as happy it ain't me that's going down. Huh? Yes. Why not take it? Behind. What are you talking about? It'll be cold and dark down no. there at 20 Fathom. <laughs> Might be sights as tank good for a man to see. In the dark and alone. <laughs> take him, you wander on like an old woman. I reckon the look of 40,000 pounds will cure a heap of other sights. I'm ready, sir. Except to secure the faceplate. Good. You know how to operate the valve? Aye, sir. And turn on the air. George, hmm? you'll find the chest in Captain's cabin. Move it if you can. We'll see about the chances of getting a line on it. Right, Joe. And good luck. Aye, good luck. Good luck. Well, cheerio, lad. I closed the little glass window in my helmet and fastened it. Then I edged toward the stern. Saunders was saying something, but I couldn't make out what it was. We didn't have no ladder, so I slid over the stern and hung there by the gunnel for a minute with the helmet out of the water. I took a last look at the light of day, and then I let go. Slow it was. I sunk down through that green water. The only sound was the air of bubbling out of the helmet valve. That valve, you understand, was the only way you had of controlling the descent of old Jimmy Goggles. If you opened it up, down you'd go. If you clamped it fairly tight, the suit would get full of air and up you'd pop as fast as a man had cared to. Full five minutes or more it took to sink that twenty fathom. Them ghostly sea ferns went slithering past like snakes and big purple and red clumps of jagged coral and the light from the surface getting dimmer and dimmer. So as by the time I hit bottom, it was pretty near dark. I was happy to find myself come right down on the deck of the old ocean pioneer. Ah, and a familiar sight she was, saving for the crabs skittering around her planks, and the blooming fish swimming past my head and goggling in through the window of my helmet. I made my way to the deck cabin. Right before the door, I stumbled onto a blinking skeleton, lying there on the deck as peaceful as you please. Judging by the gold braid still hanging on it, it had been old Captain Wells himself. Though there weren't enough left of it now to make a decent meal for an hungry guppy. Bob Durant, like, very gentle when I touched it, and all the time was wearing an horrible grin on its bony face. I'd like to give a man the shivers. Tell you certain I got through the business down there as quick as I could. Found the chest of gold and figured out the best way to get a blocking line on it. But even so, it must have been an half hour before I clamped the air valve and started for the top. Halfway up, something hit my helmet and slid on down past. I found myself looking right into the blooming face of First Mate Saunders. His mouth was hanging open, and a kind of pink smoke was drifting out of it and making a cloud in the water. I saw he had a spear run through his neck from one side to the other, and he was dead on the mackerel. He sunk on past out of sight, and then Jacobs drifted down from above. And I could see his head was all twisted to one side like and his neck was broken. He was dead, too. Then it hit me. The lads on top had been massacred by a boatload of them blooming heathen savages. And like as not if I poked my head out, the same would happen to me. Oh, blimey. 
I cracked open the helmet valve and shot down toward the bottom. I sat down there on a sunken rock for nigh on to 15 minutes, I guess, trying to figure out what to do. But any way a man had looked at it, there weren't but one answer. But finally, crazy as it seemed, I got up and started out to walk ashore. bottom began to slope up and it wasn't so dark anymore. Finally, my helmet poked up out of the water. I saw the beach about 50 yards away with dark jungle right behind it. I sloshed on through the water and came out on the sand. Then I opened the faceplate and Jimmy goggled dead, cut off the air from the tank and took a deep breath of the natural kind. That's when I saw them. At least a hundred blinking savages painted up like banshees. It stepped out of the brush and started moving toward me, slow. Beaten soft on a couple of drums and growling low and evil-like. Well, George Herbert, you're in for it now, I tell myself. Half a mile of underwater walking and you're still forgetting your blooming throat cut. I snapped the face to partway shut and cracked the air valve a bit. The diving suit swelled up like a blessed frog. And I started walking toward them. When I got close, they moved back along two sides of a kind of path. And I walked right down the middle of it. It led back into the jungle and pretty quickly come out in a little clearing with the grass up, standing in the middle of it. And sitting in front of the hut was an even idol, carved out in koa wood. It was grinning about as hideous as he ever hoped to see. And the idea hit me. I was in a spot. It couldn't be much worse, and maybe it would work. The natives seemed to be awed by Jimmy Goggles already. So I reached out and gave the idol a great push. Expecting any second to feel a spear through my gullet. I looked up. Blimey, if them heathens weren't down on their faces, worshipping like mad. It had worked. Oh. Not me, you understand, except in the manner of speaking. It was Jimmy Goggles with his copper head and his one glass eye, with me inside him. They'd seen him walk up out in the sea, and they figured he was a god. <laughs> Old rum-soaked Jimmy Goggles. A regular blooming god. <laughs> I began to get on my nerves, so I went inside the hut. They stayed outside and didn't follow me, but they didn't go away, neither. In a couple of hours, it started to get dark, and I was wondering if they meant to spend the rest of their lives out there bowing on the ground. Finally, a tall native, painted up like a circus clown, stepped inside the door and stood there, just grinning like old Satan himself. Blimey, if I had me a pistol, my beauty, I'd have you grinning on the other side of your face. Oh, would you now? Huh? <laughs> what? You're thinking mighty bold for a man who's had a lot of luck. Uh, depart, unworthy mortal, for I'll smite you with, with light. Oh, relax, one. I've been some time around plantations in Papua. Hmm? Learned thing or two I did, including English language. Jump in, Christopher. What the devil are you doing here? Taking advantage of my simple bedroom. Something else I learned at Papua. My name is uh, Mamala. I'm high priest, witch doctor. Call it whatever you want. Well, I'm happy to know you. Mine's George Herbert, officer of the English brig Pride of Banya. The late brig, you might say. Boy, it burned it a couple of hours ago. Burned it? What for? Aye. And why was it you attacked us in the first place? Oh, a bit of go like that once in a while keeps boys feeling joyful like George. It's a harmless in manner of speaking. Harmless, is it? Not for my boys, it weren't. Oh, well. What were you diving for out there, anyhow? Pearls. So it's now, mate. You are looking over that wreck down there on the reef. What's aboard her? All right, Mamela. She was carrying 40,000 pounds in gold dust. 40,000 pounds? Hmm. 
no where it is. Aye. Hmm. We could use 40,000 pounds, couldn't we, George? I'm listening. We might make deal. You keep on being the god, and I be your high priest. You can't talk their language anyway. Between us, we'll have him eating out of our hand. Meanwhile, we'll figure a way to raise gold off the bottom. Old off. You mean I gotta go on wearing this blooming suit all the time? Only if you want to stay alive. They found there was man inside it. <laughs> I tell you two pieces. Oh, Brahmi, it ain't all it's cracked up to be being a god. At least you're alive, me. And uh, we'll both be rich. Aye. Are you going to spend the night out there? We'll be leaving after ceremony, except for guards of honor. I understand you. Uh... What's the ceremony? Oh, a little piece of business with owner of Briggs. We <laughs> captured him alive, you know. Captain Ferguson? Hmm. What kind of business? A bit of this, a bit of that. When they get done, they cook him, of course. Cook him? Well, now, you wouldn't expect boys to eat him raw. <laughs> wouldn't be civilized, you know. Uh, see you in the morning, uh, George. Oh, it was pretty horrible, all right. But what with one thing and another, I didn't feel as bad about it as I might have. After all, I hadn't known the captain too well anyhow. <laughs> Nearly a month went by in mighty uncomfortable fashion. And all the time, Mamela was trying to figure some way to get that gold out of the wreck. I was right in with him at first. And I got to notice, and now he was always saying what what he could do with 40,000 pounds. And then I'd kind of remind him we was affers, and he'd grin, strange-like, and see, that's what he meant all the time. But I didn't trust him, no way. And I started stalling every way I could, and things stayed about as they were. I kept on being a garden. We couldn't get no proper chance to go after the gold. Then one morning, Mamala and most of the tribe went back into the jungle to hunt. I was sitting in the hut trying to think of some way to do for that heathen before he could do for me. When I happened to hear voices outside. I sneaked a look through the palm thatch. It was an Englishman, dressed up fit to kill in white canvas shorts and a sun helmet and all. They had a native interpreter all dressed up and walking with him. They're idols. Tribal cards. But it's been turned over. Do they no longer worship that thing? Master, I Looky here, Tams. If you step inside, I'll show you what they're worshipping. Come in, come in. Welcome, Jen. Please. Oh, I've taught you better. Oh, now, take it easy, lad. Nothing but a diving suit, you know. Yes, yes, of course. I I saw that. Who are you, anyway? Yeah, now, let's not be asking names, seeing as I didn't ask yours. Well, there's no objection to telling you, sir. It's Bender. I'm with the Royal Anglico Papuan Missionary Society. No, not really. Please. No profanity. Hmm. Must be a place. How'd you get here? By sailing cutter, down coast from the Ban Keel residency. Well, you've had a bit of luck. If the boys were here, you'd be in a proper fix by now. Oh, I dare say we'd be in no danger. No danger, huh? What is it you'd call being cooked like a pork tenderloin? Have they done it to one of my friends? An adventurer, no doubt. But the natives are well aware that if anything happened to me... There'd be a gunboat here from the residency in 48 hours. Oh, that's how the wind blows, is it? It is indeed. And they're out for your masquerading in that diving rig? Aye. To keep from getting myself killed, that's why. The natives think this flank and rubber union suits the regular god. I see. And you've been playing on their childish credulity. Childish it may be, Mr. Bender, but they've got full-grown teeth. Aye, and I've seen them in action. Well, you'll simply have to take your chances, because I'm going to... Yeah, now you can't be doing that. 
Well, if they was to find out I'm a human being, they'd do me in for fair. Well, I'll help you as much as I can. But you should have thought of that before you tried exploiting them. But, but, but you, you can't let it happen to a fellow Englishman. Then why don't you leave now while they're away? You'd likely be able to get aboard the ship that's working a mile or so down the coast. What ship? Um, salvage vessel looking for a wreck. They think it might have drifted down the channel from the north. Oh, it just might have been there. They might find it. Mr. Bender, I'll make a proposition. I won't promise anything. But I'll listen. Leave here now and sail down the coast a ways and stay till not four. Then come back as soon as it's dark and I'll let you expose me to your heart's content. Like you might say, Mr. Bender. I'll even welcome it. Weren't nothing else to do. If that salvage ship found who I was, I'd be in it for good. They'd know by now that we'd filed a false report about the position of the wreck as we could get the gold for ourselves. Uh, they'd put me in the brig for sure. And if I tried to leave with Bender, he'd turn me into the first British resident we come across. Ah, oh, I had no chance at all at the 40,000. And if I stayed here, luck as not, I'd end up parceled amongst a hundred even stomachs. But I had one chance of showing that blinking mammal as how you weren't the only one that knew a thing or two. I finally took Bender into leaving, and about dusk, Mamela and the boys came back. Understand that uh, nosy man, Bender, was snooping around here this afternoon, George. Know anything about him? Bender, eh? Oh, that's who it was. Uh, I saw him prowling around the clearing, but he didn't come inside the yacht. I'd have given him what for if he had. Yes, it's a good thing he didn't. It's a blasted nuisance, always interfering with established customs of the people. Like it. Witch doctors, eh, Mamela? God, too, George. <laughs> he do for you quick and he would be. Yeah. Uh, why don't the boys just eat it? No, no, no. That would be too dangerous. He'd be missed and they'd send gunboats. Not still around here somewhere, is he? No. Women say he sailed on south. Good. I'd just as leave not meet him face to face. <laughs> it was for him with uh, that face you're wearing. Aye, and I'm nigh under being fed up with wearing it. Uh, Mamela, me, Artie. I'll make you a proposition. Mm -hmm. What uh, kind of proposition, George? Why don't you take over being God? And uh, what would you be doing if that happened? Oh, leave me some food and water in one of the boats, and as soon as it's dark, I'll cut and run for it. It'll be easy for you to get the gold that way. Aye. And you can have the old 40,000. Your generosity embarrasses me, George. Anyways, uh, supposing I was up and die sudden like. How'd you explain my body to the boys? <laughs> I have been thinking about that. But I hadn't figured it out yet. I was wondering if you hadn't been. <laughs> you know a thing or two, don't you, George? Enough to know you weren't going to share with me unless you had to. Frankly, you're right. This may be best way. I'd have my little brethren right under my thumb. And you out of my way with no need for explanation. All right, George. I'll keep the boys away from the clearing so you can make your break. Both be ready in half hour. <laughs> Good luck. Well, <laughs> oh, it's working out just as nice as you please. <laughs> I made my break all right, but I wasn't heading for any boat. No, sir, not me. Leastwise, not yet. I hid myself in the jungle at the edge of the clearing. Then I waited. After a while, them savages started drifting back into the clearing, and pretty soon Mamela, all dressed up in Jimmy Goggles, came out and sat in front of the hut, the way I'd been doing every night. 
and the blooming Eden started in bowing down, all just as usual. I waited a long time before I finally heard it. A commotion starting over at the far edge of the clearing and coming closer. It was Bender and his boy Friday walking through the crowd to where Jimmy Goggle's set was mammally inside him. The crowd moved aside and let him pass, but you could tell they were just waiting for that one-eyed god of theirs to knock him down dead. He stopped in front of the hut. All right, I'm back. Suppose you carry out your part of the bargain and take off that... Get out, you fool! I didn't really believe you were honest. All right, Thomas. Tell the natives this is nothing but a man dressed up. I got it! Blimey, if Bender didn't jump onto Memel and start turning at the front of the diving suit. And all the time that heathen witch doctor kept trying to fight him off. And it seemed as though Mamala hadn't known how to fasten the helmet properly because suddenly it tipped back on his shoulders and there he was. A face them savages knew as well as their own offspring. And I didn't like it even one little bit. Aye. Right. They'd been taken in by one of their hometown boys, so to speak, and they weren't for having any. They didn't arm Bender, none, but they shoved him off to one side. They made one grand rush from Memphis. <laughs> and they got it. And blimey, what happened then wasn't downright uncivil. I cut and run for it and tumbled into that boat and shoved off. I couldn't help but feel a bit sorry for old Memler. Though it wasn't as if he hadn't eaten his own share of human beings. But of course, he certainly wasn't a man who could be trusted at all. Well, it was a long time after... Before I heard how Mr. Bender made out. Seems as how he couldn't get them blues and blooming easements to listen to him at all. And one day he hit on the idea of climbing into that diving suit. And from then on he had a crowd around every time he'd open his mouth. As far as I know, old Jimmy Goggles may still be down there, Summers. With his battered copper head and his rummy smell. And his one glass eye, he may still be doing business. Right down there at the same old stand. <laughs>